Perfecto. And I will share my screen. Amazing, everybody. Okay, so I am super excited once again to have you all be joining us and having these three lovely women here with us to dive into tips for making high performing TikTok or ads on TikTok. Before I get into like the meat and potatoes of everything we'll chat in through today, I just wanted to give a brief intro on motion and what we are all about here. So essentially, motion, if I can move my slides accordingly. Uh, there we go. There we go. Motion is the hub for creative strategy. And essentially what that means and why we do what we do is that creative has become the most important part of all elements of paid advertising at this point. But what we also know is that on one hand, we have our media buying teams who are super analytical. And on the other hand, we have our creative teams who are exactly that, more creative. So they need to operate in lockstep. And at Motion, we define this gap in how we bridge it as the creative strategy workflow. So what that means for today is that we're going to be diving pretty deep into the creative strategy workflow and flywheel of if you follow these steps, you'll be able to help bridge the gap that we see here. And how Motion currently helps enable this is we make it super easy and uh, visual to analyze, visualize like I did mention, and then share these insights across your team. So we've got you covered. The last thing that I'm going to note here is just a couple of housekeeping pieces. So the very first thing is like, again, we have a lovely community here. So if you have any questions, please throw them into our chat, replying to everybody. Of course, I'm going to throw it uh, to the team here. But also, if you have opinions, answer those. We want to see what everyone thinks. The last thing I'll note on questions is I have a teammate, Carissa, who's in the chat. So she'll be able to help anything motion related. The second thing to note here really quickly is that this is obviously being recorded. So we will go ahead and share this after the event to anyone who is registered. And then finally, we want your feedback. When we run, when we run these sessions, we always are curious on what you want to learn. So if you have any thoughts, we're sending a quick survey out after this event. Please, please, please fill in any commentary that you might have. So that's the stage, everybody. And the stage, why we are setting it, is like I was saying, is for these three amazing women right here who I um, who I really respect. So I'm going to try and do them justice, but we'll throw it at them if I have any questions that come to mind. But on the right-hand side here, we have Jenny in the building. So Jenny is the director of TikTok at Power Digital. Um, she oversees the whole shebang. So everything from our ads to content creator, influencer management, paid ads, all of that good stuff. On the left-hand side here, we have Isabel. I'm lucky to have known Isabel for a little bit of time now. We actually got to hang out in New York when I was there. So it was absolutely incredible. Isabel is the Associate Director of, pay, um, of Paid at tick, for TikTok uh, at Power Digital. She honestly is uh, super strategic when it comes to the media buying side of things, knows all of this good stuff in and out. And then finally, last but not least, is Grace. So Grace is the Senior Content Producer at Power Digital. And she really just helps brings bring creative to life from start to finish. And essentially what that means is all the great brands we know, like FabFit, DoorDash, Savage Fenty, whoever it might be, Grace does her thing. So can I please get a round of applause for these amazing women in the building with us today? Hey team, how's it going? It's so, uh, it's so great to have you here. Thanks for putting up with me talking so much. <laughs> <laughs> we love Thanks it. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Awesome. So I'm thinking we can keep it nice and easy right now, just with a really quick icebreaker before we get into the meat and potatoes here. So Isabel, I'm going to throw it at you first here. Is there a quick win uh, that you've experienced that you might be able to share with the group uh, that you've experienced over the past month or so? Yeah, definitely. Um, so if you're running ads on TikTok or just at, on TikTok as a user, as one of their many, many users, I'm sure you're familiar with CapCut, which is owned by ByteDance as well. Something that we have really, really tapped into and leaned into and seen perform really well across the board, um, especially when it comes to paid ads, is leveraging trending templates. So it's more so those meme-based creatives that are a really quick turnaround time. You just need one static photo, you adjust the text overlay, and it, per it has killed it across many, many of our clients' advertising accounts for TikTok specifically. And I think that can be attributed to one, trends on TikTok really come and go, and capitalizing on those trends quickly is so important. Um, and to combating that ad fatigue that we see from the paid front. So I would say that's that's the win. 
That's incredible. And honestly, the win could have been anything. And this is why Isabel is so good at what she does and keeps it strategic. Because right away when we talk wins, we're talking about things that we can walk away with and do immediately. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, everyone in the audience, basically for today's show, what we're doing is we're talking, how do we make high performing ads on TikTok? And like I spoke about earlier, we're really focused in on this creative strategy flywheel. But before we get into any of these buckets here, I kind of wanted to set the stage for like what PDM is all about. So Jenny, quick question for you. Can you talk to the, to the audience a little bit about like team structure and who really helps enable this workflow that we see here? Yeah, so I'll get into just kind of the fruition of our department because it's pretty odd that a lot of us have TikTok in our job title. Um, so whenever TikTok became, we were able to start monetizing it, what, like two years ago, two plus years ago, we had different team members in each team. So the creative team, the media buying team, the influencer team, the organic social team working in more silos um, on TikTok for our clients. However, in the past year plus, we developed our own department where these individuals are now only working together and only working on TikTok so that we can prioritize the platform, make sure that we combat ad fatigue. We're all working more synonymously and together versus in these different silos. So um, our team here, we actually have two of the team leaders on this call. So um, Grace and Isabel really help lead our ads and creative teams. Um, and they're also pod leaders as well. So we have each discipline within pods together where they're working on the same clients together. Um, they understand each other's workflow. They understand if we have a client expedited need, they can work together to make sure that we're prioritizing what needs to be prioritized. It also helps just separate out workflow, helps everyone understand what everyone does. So um, a media buyer gets to learn from an organic person, um, influencer, individuals get to learn from content producers. So we all get to learn um, together and make the best content and the best uh, just ads, creative, whatever it may be for our clients. So that's a little bit of how we're structured. And they're also vertical specific. That's our dream. That's what we're getting into. So we have specific verticals that each person owns as well. Um, and then two or so pod leaders for each vertical to make sure that we're, um, yeah, just spanning the knowledge that our whole team has and that we're all learning from each other. I love it, Jenny. The one follow-up that I have is how does this start to play nicely with other, uh, let's say paid social channels, but mm -hmm. also just like other channels in general. So in your world, it's the TikTok piece, but then there's Facebook, then there's the YouTube side. How does that totally. all come together? Yeah, so it all comes together because we're all talking to each other. So um, when Grace delivers a creative to our TikTok team, it will also be seen by the meta team. It'll get sent to the meta team. The YouTube team will see it. Everyone will see it. So we're all sharing resources, which is really great because we all know that TikTok ads perform well on meta. They perform well on YouTube shorts. Not always is the other side reciprocated there. However, even if it's sharing content and footage with each other so that we make sure that we're delivering more to our clients um, and the best quality while also sharing resources, making sure that we're just driving performance across the board. Cool. Thank you very much. Okay. So now let's dive into this workflow a little bit here. And in this initial research bucket, for anyone who's attended our events before, this is all the information that you want to gather to help build out what your personas are going to look like and who you should go after. Um, Grace, I'm going to throw this one at you. Do you have any information on your end of like how you think about research, how you get started with research or anything that you'd be willing to share? Yeah, I think from a creative perspective specifically, I think research is the most fundamental part of kicking off a partnership. So we bake into every single contract with any new client, a what we call a holistic channel analysis, where we go through each and every team that is working on the TikTok platform. And we work together to create a whole holistic strategy as you know, aptly named. Um, and we really walk through every single step of our strategy to align with the client that it's what they're looking looking for, as well as we look on our own to find trends that are working within the platform. We're looking at 
various outside sources in terms of reviews, in terms of all of these different resources that we have available to us. And we find a way to kind of create a strategy, present it to them, and then get that trust moving from the jump. So that way, as we're ideating, it's not really this back and forth issue of, oh, I don't really understand where you're coming from with XYZ perspective. They immediately are locked in. They understand our strategy before we even start producing creatives. So that's definitely, I think, our best strategy in terms of research. That makes me super happy to hear the word holistic. I say it all the time and it's the most empowering, right? And I think that one follow-up question that I have there is again, the tasks, we know a lot of people will follow them, but it starts to become the efficiencies and team members who are tackling them, right? So all three of you, uh, a little bit different in your disciplines with Jenny, seeing everything and how it goes. So Grace, who actually helps drive this process of searching for the reviews, getting some of the past information and all of that good stuff? Yeah, so each team kind of has their own individual duties specifically within this analysis that we provide for them. And I think the creative side, we're really digging into style goals in terms of how we want our content to look right. and feel, as well as how we want our content to sound. So that's an, those are like the two major, major nuggets for creative. And both of those things lie in that research, in that consumer research. What are people who are using the product actually talking about on TikTok? What are they posting themselves? So pulling that kind of information, it really does lie in the creative entirely, I think, that, that section. Awesome. And then Isabel, in your world with that initial research, are you also helping contribute there with like previous information that might exist yes, in that account? Definitely. So from the paid perspective for this holistic analysis that we do share with clients, it's dependent, the approach is dependent on two things. One, if they've never ran TikTok ads before, um, right. then there's different areas that we would look into in terms of like what their competitors are doing on TikTok, what what other brands that fall in the same vertical are doing on TikTok as well as existing advertisers of ours who are similar in terms of the product they offer and the AOV and the audience that they're trying to reach. Um, but for advertisers who come to us and, and we kick off our partnership with them, um, it's more of an in-depth analysis of what they've done historically from a paid perspective, what their creative has looked like historically from a paid perspective. So that's again, like where the collaboration between the paid team and, and Grace's creative team would come into play as well as relaying those insights from that historical deep dive, um, as well as identifying areas based on performance in the past that can be improved upon, um, as well as pivots that we can make too. I love it. Last, I love it. The last little nugget I'll share there too is um, if they're already on TikTok organically or ads wise, we can and do dig into what that audience currently looks like. So once again, that audience might change if we take a creative pivot or whatever it may be. Um, and we also look at existing audience information. So Google Analytics, what persona information and customer research the client has. And what's cool that our team does is we basically take those data points and then through our knowledge of TikTok, perceive who those people will be on TikTok that we want to reach. Because they're different from Meta, they're different from Snapchat, they're different from YouTube. So if Isabel pulls an audience insights report from TikTok um, and sees that, okay, actually most of the conversions on the ad side is coming from 18 to 24 year old, but the overall um, client does have a cohort of customers that's 45 plus. Okay. That is an opportunity for us to keep in mind, but we should be also just sharing the data and working off the data, which will then influence who Grace is going after in terms of talent and concept ideas. It'll influence who our influencer strategists are going after in terms of um, audience personas as well. So, and we can get similar insights organically as well. So we kind of try to take everything and then align on the personas that we're going to be reaching across the different disciplines on TikTok. Fantastic. And I love the word persona because ultimately all of the work that you're doing to uncover what has happened in the past or where potential exists is building that persona, right? But that ultimately brings us to like the ideation phase here. We have a persona of who we know what we want to go after. The big question is, is like, what the heck do we go after them with? at the end of the day, right? So the I have a pretty broad question in all honesty, but Grace, I'm gonna to toss it at you because you live and breathe creative here. It's like, where the heck do you start? How do you determine what you're making? How do you prioritize what happens here? Yeah, and I think, 
I mean, great question. Uh, it's one that I ask myself all the time. I think I the biggest thing is it's a case by case basis. Every client is going to be different. So we need to start with the fundamentals of how are people talking about this client right now, as is before we even get involved. So really digging into the platform to see what concept formats are we seeing most often? Are we seeing trends? Are we seeing ASMR concepts? Are we seeing green screens that offer a little bit more education? So we pull those insights. We try and discover which like five concept formats are we really seeing the most often? And then that's where we pull in to the sort of strategic framework where we have each and every one of our content producers fully trained within motion to be able to read motion reports from a creative perspective. And this is an absolutely imperative thing for our strategic process, because we are looking from a creative perspective, we most often at thumb stop rate and click through rate. And this gives us the most amount of information in terms of where we can take concepts that are working and how we can build on them. So for example, if we're looking at our previous month's creatives and we see one that is killing it with a hook rate, oh my gosh, that thumb stop is killing it. But the click through rate is not great. But we have another concept whose hook might not be so good, but the click-through rate is incredible. What do we do? We mash those two concepts together. And this collaboration that we have with the strategists comes in when we start talking about other testing opportunities. So Isabel, I want to hear sort of your perspective on the ideation phase from the paid side too, because I think you'd have great perspective. Yeah, definitely. So for ideation, we also keep in mind um, the two different paths forward that we can take, one being iteration, where our media buyers take it upon themselves to change a hook quickly on an existing creative to a previous top performer, or one we want to test, or um, moving one duration of a creative towards the beginning because we thought it would drive a stronger click-through rate at this point of the creative. And then the variation aspect of things where the insights and the collaboration comes into play and we identify with the creative team, this is the strongest thumb stop capture retention. Let's dive into these different elements and use that to, um, to in future concept ideation as well. Um, and that is an ongoing thing. That's, that's something that we really, really harp on and, and, underscore in terms of importance um, that the approach to creative is data backed as well. And I love it. This being said, Evan, as well, I think something worth mentioning is Yes, our iteration and our variation process is extensive, but we are always trying to stay ahead of the curve as well. So we're always including net new ideas, always testing new opportunities. So that way we can continue to ideate and variate with those new concepts as well. So that's exactly where I wanted to follow up because mm -hmm. something that comes to mind for me is just the like, we can nail it out crystal clear here is just the definitions of, of, of what we're chatting about here. Cause we're throwing around like new concepts, iterations, variations, like, can we, um, I'm not sure who's best to call in here, but can we walk through like a quick definition list of what that looks like? And then I'll have a couple follow-ups that come to mind for me. Yeah, I can definitely jump in here. I think our sort of iteration versus variation process is a bit more of an internal phrasing. I think they are often used interchangeably within the industry just casually. Um, but within our internal sort of definition, we consider iterations to be something that can be quickly adjusted. So we have our paid strategists as well trained in cap cut. So we see that we have both sides trained in the others sort of, you know, thing. Um, but we have them able to go in, switch quick hooks, uh, switch up opening clips, readjust the order of clips, basically anything that does not require anything net new, we can go ahead and allow our paid strategists to quickly adjust so that way we can keep up with iterations as quickly as possible. Our variation process is something that would need to be pitched. So this is something that would require any net new element, whether that's a new talent or we're focusing on a new skew or we're creating a new narrative with a similar format. Something along those lines, we want to be sure that we're running everything by the client first, um, if anything is required of net new. So that's sort of the way that we differentiate between the two. Isabel, you and I are going to talk about those iterations later, just because paid <laughs> yeah. media buyers and CapCut bringing it to life. Hold on. What's going on? I love it. We I love, love it. it. 
<laughs> but Grace, one thing I did want to follow up with you is specifically on those variations. So mm -hmm. sounding like those net new ideas that require net new elements, right? So that's where I'm super curious about like, again, in this research bucket, we have those personas that we've been able to outline. How are we determining like what of a variation will we line up with the persona, meaning us versus them, five-star reviews, this specific UGC or script? How do you go about prioritizing that? Does it live anywhere? Is there any information you can share? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really great point. I think in terms of our variation process, I think in terms of priority of persona, I think we want to lean into obviously what's working best. So if we're seeing a particular concept format with one persona really, really working, why not try testing an alternate persona in that format and see what happens? Then great, we get opportunities to test those two, and then we can build on further. So really, it's finding locking in on concepts that are working and then bringing a new persona into it to see if that works and then testing the puzzle pieces and moving things around as you do it really is a puzzle that you just have to find the right match to the right concept i like to think of it as like the world is our oyster we could go mm -hmm. in so many directions but it's like how do we ultimately make those decisions jenny did you want to jump in real quick yeah, I was also going to say, I think that's where the initial and continuous research Grace and team are doing plays a part. So, and what I mean by that is for a lot of the clients we work with, people naturally post about them on TikTok. So it's not paid for posts, people talking about these brands on their own. And you can get an idea of also different consumers based on those people. So you right. might see how a 50-year-old is speaking about a shoe versus a 20-year-old. What are the different um, pros and cons are talking about what are the comments saying so it's really I think in that continuous research that's getting done where we stay on top of what's being talked about with our client naturally and organically on the platform too that then also can give us an idea of how to reach these personas even better um, and then also like Grace mentioned too it's if we see if something is working well for one persona, one group of audience, can we replicate it? Can we switch out the talent? Or does that concept not work well at all? We need to start from scratch and bring some new ideas to the table or look at our playbook of what's performing well across that industry and see if there's some easy wins we can apply. Entirely. And the next step of this is like, once we've been able to uh, to go through the jungle gym of determining what to make next, I've, I've talked to a lot of people just around like scripting their videos, sourcing their actors or whoever it might be. And there's like a wide range of opinions. Some people believe in giving personas and letting the actors do their work, whereas some people believe in like full scripts and go down that route. I'm wondering where, where Power Digital sits on the spectrum when you are working with different actors, creators uh, along the line. So Grace, maybe I'll throw that at you as well. Yeah, so we have built out with our wonderful casting point person on our team, an entire Rolodex of talent that we really trust and that we continuously use across all of our accounts. So we know that these talent do what they need to do. So we're able to provide them with scripts that are a little bit looser in order for us to be able to get back stuff that feels genuine and feels authentic. But with that being said, I can also share my screen into a look at our templates. Um, and yeah, I if I can do that just real fast. Awesome. Thanks, Grace. Yeah, of course. Sorry. And I think, too, maybe we can answer um, Nicole's question on ideal time and budget to run test creative, or maybe not. Grace, you were fast. Holy smokes. <laughs> I had it pulled up. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, I can chat through it super quick. Honestly, really the main things that I wanted to share is... There's a balance of giving too much information and not giving enough. We want to keep things authentic and we want to give the creator the opportunity to have a little bit of that creative freedom because we don't know. We're not there. We shoot remotely more often than not with our talent. So we don't know what's going to happen in the situation. So we want to give them the flexibility and all the information possible for them to not make a mistake, you know? So we give them all of the inspiration and overview of our entire concept. And then we go into to super important shooting guidelines. We give them the do's and don'ts for each and every brand down to like 
making sure you clean your camera before you shoot. Um, and then we go into more specific info. We work with talent that are able to send us individual clips for everything. So this works extremely well to be able to repurpose footage, to be able to create net new concepts out of all of the clips that we receive for a concept. Um, and then we provide them with every single ounce of product info that they need, any products that they'll be touching. And then we give them a super fleshed out shot list. So this is where we're giving them angles. We're telling them anything that we need to have in the concept, we are super explicit on. Anything that we want to give them a little bit more flexibility, we allow that. So very, very easy to kind of balance that out and make sure that you're getting what you need. And then from here, we give all sorts of visual inspiration for them. We allow them to kind of get a sense of what we want the final concept to really look like in a frame by frame process. So really, it's providing them as much information as they can while still giving them the opportunity to flex to be flexible within the concept, you know? Yeah, for sure. And, and Grace, this, uh, like these stages that we're seeing here, because frameworks are so helpful to see all mm -hmm. of this within, is this technically your brief that you're delivering or are these so, just like internal management of process? Yeah. So this is all internal. So I can swap to the next one. Um, here is a pitch that we would provide to the client. Um, these aren't the same concepts. This is an alternate pitch, but this is sort of an overview of what the client gets to see. They get just sort of a basic overview of everything. Um, we have found that a lot of the time, if we give too much information and then the client gets locked in on that, they're not able to see a finalized concept as a finalized concept. So we want to give a bit more of a high level overview of everything in order to allow us the flexibility on our end to make any sort of strategic decisions that we need to make within like the QA edit process. So we give them a goal Goal of our concept, which is really data backed, we include any sort of information on what is currently performing within, you know, what elements we want to pull and bring into this concept. And then we also include any sort of USPs that we really want to highlight. Then we go into some high level visual ideas, any sort of on screen text that we really need to get approved if a client is particularly picky about that. We give them an idea of what we want for our audio and then the deliverable details for how long that concept is going to be, as well as a visual reference for them to really be able to see what that concept could look like when it comes to fruition. So yeah, just basically a high level overview of each and every concept that we plan on producing for them. That's phenomenal, Grace. And I had a couple questions just come into the chat here. Paula and John shared a similar sentiment, but they're curious now. It's like, if you get approval on one of these variations or new concepts, it becomes a question of like sourcing talent to be able to shoot this. How do you, Paula asks, can you give any tips on how to find talent? And John asks, how do you go about sourcing talent at the end of the day? So falling into the same vein. Totally. I think something that is so fascinating about right now, UGC in general is just becoming a boom and so many people are interested in becoming a UGC creator. So it's on us to really do the deep dives, to find the creators online who only have a hundred followers, something along those lines and get them involved. So we work with a really strong an ongoing casting reach out process where we're constantly reaching out to people and asking if they're interested, if they'd want to shoot with us. And that honestly is what gives us the best opportunity. People who are interested in shooting for the brands that we work with are going to give us the best footage possible. So really making sure that we're finding creators that feel like the actual consumer and would be excited to use this product. And then in terms of actually working with talent in terms of finding the right talent for a concept. A lot of this is a balance. What we love to do is we find a batch of talent for each brand that we really want to lean into that will obviously add more, remove some based on performance and based on, you know, client feedback, all of that good stuff, but really trying to lock in on some creators that we trust, that we know that if I were to give this spring has sprung mashup, whatever to them, they'd be able to to execute, no problem. So we want to find people that are able to execute every single time. That's the goal. I love and, it. And it, oh, sorry, go, go ahead, Jen. The, the one was, thing I was going to ask is a follow up just off of uh, something else that I saw someone else ask here. It's just, if you can share, 
are there any, when you're talking about sourcing and casting a wide net to be able to find who you need, are you able to share like any of those specific sources that you'll go to, whether it be like Twitter, Instagram, Mm -hmm. like all of that kind of stuff? All of the above. Honestly, I think there's no, there's no place where people are not going to be like in terms of social media, we can reach out on Instagram. Yes. TikTok, obviously, uh, Twitter. Sure. There are definitely a lot of UGC creators who function a lot on Twitter to get outreach. We also have platforms like backstage where if we're looking for more niche talent that require a certain skill, for example, like hair talent, definitely need to have that skill to be able to do their hair on camera easily. And yeah, so backstage, I think is one that we use the most often for those more niche type of concepts that require that skill. And then what's also really great about um, our teams working so closely together is our influencer part of our department is performance-based influencer. So it means partnering with maybe influencers with smaller reach for spark ad usage to then bolster revenue and performance for our clients. So sometimes we'll see um, that a influencer we've used on the spark ad side of things, they might be a good fit to become a UGC creator with our team. They love UGC. They love the brands they're working with. Um, so we can also just cross pollinate that way as well. And then the last thing I was going to say is, um, we do have like a large creator community at PD. So basically where, we people will submit their names and basically ask to become a creator for our company and then we'll see how their initial concepts come out when they um are filming themselves and then the grace and team will go through and be like oh they're actually really good do we want to see and have them be like a dedicated creator for our team so it's a lot of different angles <laughs> It's so great because ultimately what we're able to just talk through is just like briefing the actual creation, a lot of the internal workflow to get to where we need. And I think where I'd want to go with this next is into our launch and creative analysis bucket for two reasons. First, it's just like we've had a lot of questions start to come in related to them. And the second is, is like speaking to the iteration definition you had mentioned earlier. So uh, I'm going to keep this a little bit more open first before I dive into the audience's questions here. But Isabel, when it comes to launching on TikTok, is there a typical like launch strategy that you'll follow for new and inge- um, basically new clients, but then also creative testing down the line? Yeah, definitely. So in terms of the launch strategy specifically for for advertisers that may not be having ha- have pushed ads on TikTok previously, is we have and put together a entire strategy in place moving let's say this advertiser is conversion focused which i would say the majority of our clients are um moving down the funnel so we're starting optimizing towards the highest funnel event moving our way down the funnel efficiently in a way that the budget can support the cpa that's coming in um we also need to make sure as well that there is a really strong cadence of creative coming in um which Creative makes and break makes or breaks performance on TikTok. I think everyone here knows that. Um, TikTok is such a creative first platform. So making sure that we have not only a strong cadence of creative coming in, but also just strong creative, generally speaking. And that is where the iteration idea comes into play um, from the media buyer's perspective. In terms of a time, because I think I did see someone ask this question in terms of the general time that you let ads run with the spend behind it. Generally speaking, of course, it's dependent on spend. Um, obviously, if you're spending more, you would get that, those the spend behind those creatives quicker and you'd have those insights. But um, generally speaking, we recommend like seven days of, create, of create new creatives live to gather those insights. And we leverage tools, primarily Motion, which you all know. Um, And then we gather those insights and use them for any upcoming creatives that we want to rotate in and and test. In terms of budget, again, that's also that's also dependent on the brand and their product. Um, So what's what's their AOV and that that will determine and impact the budget. So typically speaking, I would say a starting point would be 250 a day to and then scaling as we see performance increase. But again, that's that's uh, dependent on the advertiser and their product. That's great. And I love the first bucket there of just being like a net new account that's going live, working our way down the funnel to be able to set it up. 
Now, let's say we've been live for X amount of months and started collecting that data there. When it comes to launching creative tests mm -hmm. into the ad account, how do you do that to make sure like getting necessary budget, getting statistically yeah. relevant data, all that good stuff? Definitely. Yeah, that's a great question. We typically, again, if we have the budget to, we definitely 100% recommend rotating in a separate ad group to test these creatives. Of course, it will take a bit um, to get out of learning, but that ensures that you get the spend you need behind those ads and you get the learnings that you need behind those ads without previous creatives that are driving stronger performance, hogging the spend. So you have the insights there that you need to then scale those creatives further, um, as well as use those insights for future creation. Perfect. One of the questions that I saw pop up that, Grace, I'm actually going to throw it back to you here, is that you work with so many different clients in, in same verticals, different verticals, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, in your world, how do you go about determining, and who asked this question if I can find it? Um, I might have lost it here, but how do you go about determining like differentiators between each of the, the brands that might be in the same vertical when you're putting together? Uh, different types of creative? That's, yeah, honestly, I think that's a great, great question to chat about. Um, every client has their own very, very unique differentiators. And a lot of these differentiators come about during this holistic channel analysis, that deep research that we're finding. Just because, for example, i presented a holistic channel analysis to a skincare brand this morning. So just using that as an example, one luxury skincare brand may not be able to do the same concepts as another luxury skincare brand simply because the actual USPs within each of the individual clients may be different. So therefore, what we're focusing on and the concept formats that are going to be most optimal will be different. So say luxury skincare brand B is really focused on sensitive skin, whereas one is all natural ingredients, we're not going to be doing the same concepts. So finding those very specific USPs that do lead to those differentiators is the number one hack that I can give for that. I often say that there is no, there are no wrong answers just within like, uh, like paid advertising, but like that one was the right answer. Just speaking about the unique brand and their USPs, like that's essentially the way you have to go. It's personalized to that extent to match the, uh, the specific audiences and personas. So I love that. Now, Isabel, I wanted to come back to you. So we started off like probably 10, 15 minutes ago, talking about those definitions of iterations and variations. Grace so kindly showed us those variation approval process and that good stuff. Now let's get to you in those iterations. There's a lot to unpack here. And the very first place that I wanted to start, like we were talking about earlier, is hold on a second. Media buyers are getting cap cut and putting some stuff together. Talk us through what that looks like when you get the asset. Is there already text on there? Like what's your team doing at this point? Yes, definitely. So when the creative is delivered, it's delivered with text overlay to push live. It's delivered with text overlay in the first three seconds, that hook, as well as like text overlay throughout, calling out those UVPs. And then of course the CTA at the end, not an overt CTA like you would see on other platforms. Um, Cause the more overtly an, it is an ad on TikTok, my hypothesis is the, is the weaker it will perform. So that's something that we also keep in mind. Um, and in, in, when we get those creatives, we obviously let them run and we get, gain those insights. But the creatives that Grace and team also deliver, they can deliver them and they do deliver them without the text overlay as well. So we can add in different hooks after a certain period of time that we want to test. And we can trim the creative and move little bits around as well. And um, that's how we go about the iteration, actually editing the creative to make it an iteration without needing any like net new footage or anything that's so good that's so good who and, who runs the training oh, that's i can good. actually share the deck here yeah sure let me stop sharing my screen really quickly 
I'll also say really quickly on that note too, that same methodology is with, if anyone is running performance influencer or influencer in general, just ask your influencers to send the videos without text overlay. That allows just the media buyers once again, and like content producers to have just a bank of footage that's being built up. Um, so once again, the team can iterate a bit faster um, and get, make performance last from each piece of content that you're getting, which is the main goal of TikTok advertising. I think another thing worth mentioning, full transparency, is it takes a long time to create these really fleshed out concepts with getting creators involved, getting product to them, getting footage that we need, outsourcing editors, et cetera, et cetera. So these very quick iterations that can literally be done in 30 seconds to five minutes, and the fact that they are able to scale an account the way that they do is absolutely incredible. So CapCut is extremely user-friendly. So get in there, test it out. That's the way that I learned how to do it. It's just by trying. So I would definitely recommend that as like a, a resource for everybody. Yeah, definitely. And I just actually, I don't have screen sharing preferences enabled for Zoom. So if someone else can share the deck, there we go, Jenny. Thank you. And I think as Jenny's pulling this up here, training will fall into two buckets for me. Like obviously there's a metrics in that portion there, but I'm also going to be curious about like even bringing media buyers who might be more analytical on the right side of the brain. Like how are we, how do you go about training them up on the type of changes they can make, how to operate within CapCut and any type of creative element at that point? I will say that's a whole other training event. So <laughs> we do like monthly training series for our whole department where like Grace and team went through a whole direct response, creating creatives training where there we, we did producing, we did how to film yourself. Like cause our whole team films themselves too. So, but Isabel, where do you want me to go first? We can hop into the paid versus creative. I think that's a good place cool. to start and touch on that quickly. Just let me know where to stop. I don't, can anyone else see the deck? I see Google Meet, Jenny. See Google Meets as well. Oh, shoot. Okay. Wow, you guys. <laughs> it's like I'm doing this for the first time. Technology is our best friend and worst enemy every single I day. I know. Sorry. I'm a, Google, I'm a Google Meet girl. Yeah, there we go. Okay, go back a bit. All right. Yeah, we can start right here. So this speaks to this was an internal training um, that we had within the TikTok department, primarily for the media buying team, as well as the creative team. So this touches on what we had discussed a bit earlier on um, in this call is what is motion and why should we be leveraging it for these different roles? So for media buying, it's saving time and that manual effort for creative reporting, identifying what works, what doesn't, et cetera, like we had chatted about. And then from the creative side, it's being able to go in and grab and analyze these actionable insights and use them for upcoming creatives that are delivered as well as capitalizing on attributes of existing creative that works. So we can go, we can go to the next one. All right, so this is one of the many slides where we touch on specific motion reporting for internal use, one being a top performing ads report, which Evan, I see you laughing, but <laughs> I know why, because this is a great one. Um, so this essentially is the report that people use the most, especially on the media buying side, and we will have duplicates of this report. And this is one of the things that we use for not only overall analysis, but also the iteration aspect of things. And we can go to the next one, Jenny, until we're at the iteration specific report slide. Here we go. So this is where we really hone in on the iteration side of things is these two reports. So a thumb stop report where we identify the strongest stop rate, where there's room for improvement in existing creatives, um, as well as capitalizing on those strong stop rates in addition to identifying the creatives that have the lowest stop rate and how we can improve that. Because potentially, like Grace had mentioned earlier on the call, the stop rate might be really low, but the conversion rate might be really high. So what do we need to do? We need to improve the stop rate. And that's just one example. The other being a creative versus landing page report, which this identifies problems maybe in the user experience when they're driven to the site. So I think the thumb stop rate is a bit more applicable here. Um, we can go to the next slide, Jenny. 
where we have an example. Awesome. So this looks at thumb stop rate in comparison to subscribe rate. So we're seeing all these creatives live. We're seeing these columns fluctuate. So what we expect our media buying team to do is go in and identify these opportunities for improvement with this being specific to stop rate. So what they will do is identify those creatives that, for example, do have a really weak stop rate, but a really high subscribe rate, which in this case is conversion rate. And they will then go and take that creative, put it in CapCut or Splice or what have you. There are a bunch of different platforms that you can use um, and apply a top performing thumb stop or text overlay within the first three seconds and then push that creative live to see if that, that makes that creative then a top performer. So that's one, one iteration that we, that we take a ton. So let's let's rewind here. I feel like you just dropped the mic on people, so we need to like slow it down a little bit. Because because basically, just so just so everyone's on the same page here, iterations are these small changes that are going to happen, and there's so many different places within a creative that we can ultimately make an iteration. And then how we determine where we're going to make that is based on metrics, right? I have four up, there could be four, there could be way more. So in this instance, Izzy, when we're talking about like the, like where to make a change and where to iterate, where are we focused here in this case? Yeah. So this is focused primarily on thumb stop. So the first three seconds, what creative is driving the strongest thumb stop rate and what creative is driving the lowest? And we'll then take that creative and make it better, essentially. That's fantastic. And from this point, like this is where you're describing is you'll look for the relationship that you had outlined, and then your media buyers will jump into CapCut or whatever it might be, and actually go ahead and stitch on a text overlay that might be working quite well or something along those lines. Exactly. And that's also, this, this leads to something that we place a lot of importance on in terms of the PDM TikTok department. And I would say PDM as a whole is the collaboration and cohesion across teams, because yes, there's an expectation that our media buyers go in and pull these insights and make these changes to creative easily and rotate them in and test to see if that has a positive impact on performance. But there's also the expectation that we are all communicating across the board about these insights specific like thumb stop here, what's being used is this information is, is most likely beneficial to all teams, especially in terms of the collaboration between paid and creative. And then Isabel, follow up on my end, Jenny, you might also have some context here too, but like we've spoken now about your iterations and then your variations. So variations, new iterations, smaller changes. Is there like a best practice that comes to mind for you of how many iterations versus how many new variations should be entering the account on a, whatever it might be, weekly, bi-weekly basis? Yeah. In terms of the number of iterations, we've, I've iterated personally four times on the same creative, and that could be changing things around, changing the hook. It could be, that could be it. That's the only thing. And I could put, I could push those four live, the only differentiator being the hook. Um, so I would say four generally, um, but in terms of the number of times iterations are tested, it usually is on a weekly basis, maybe like two times per week, one to two times per week. Yeah. And it once again goes back to each client and TikTok is such a finicky platform. Each client is so different and each performance that performs so different. So if we're starting to see indicators of creative fatigue, that's why we want our whole team to be able to um, implement creative changes so that we can make sure our client's performance doesn't fault as a result of like needing to wait for new variations to come through the door. So um, some clients we launch net new creatives twice a week, three times a week. We're always adding iterations, especially for larger budgets. It really depends across the board. And with all of this kind of stuff, like I think I saw a question come in earlier from James, just around speaking to the type of changes that you can make. He was asking, or they were asking, um, to refresh a creative, would a text overlay do the job? Or is that not enough in the grand scheme of things? I have something I can share. I just have to pull it up really fast if we want to walk through. Um, here, one second. Okay. 
So because this is an internal sort of phrasing for us, we wanted to really clearly outline everything for our individual team members to be able to get inspiration. So we have this strategist own iteration portion, which is a slightly modified version of an existing ad that is easily altered with its existing elements. So this is existing text overlay swaps. This can be an audio swap. I saw that AI text to speech voice question in the in the chat. Yes, absolutely. Adding VO, um, existing opening clip swaps. We can take a, a clip that's already in the concept and, and swap it, make it the opening clip or a, a clip that already exists that we know performs. Shortening the concept. We never know if it if a minute long concept is kind of not working for us, what if we take 15 seconds of the highlights of that one minute concept and then reordering existing clips, as we've said, this can be putting top performing SKUs earlier in the concept, something along those lines. Whereas our variations are very creative strategy forward. So this is thinking against USP versus USP, pain point versus pain point, skew versus skew, those personas we've talked about, having an emotional point of view versus technical point of view, seasonal versus evergreen, third person versus first person. These are all ideas for mainly the messaging side of things. And then we have visual and audio as well. So we can show different sort of seasonal versus evergreen elements, um, all of that stuff. We also have some stuff about actual angles that we use. We often will test talent versus in frame versus POV, green screens versus in person. And we found a lot of success in green screens, which is, that's a whole other story. But yeah, VO versus text to speech versus live speaking to camera. There's so many opportunities for us to variate that it really is, it's on a case by case basis. If we're stumped, this is a place for us to go to and see, okay, where can we move next with something that's working? And I think too, just to answer Mark, Mark's question, right, Evan? Um, yes, about micro iterations or big swings is we make the smallest changes to a creative, that being like literally adding text overlay a different hook, for example, which I know we've chatted a bit about, and that is still considered a, a new creative in TikTok um, when it's served. And the, the slide, it, that's why it's so easy for us to iterate and iterate a lot and, and very frequently because of these moves that are made that eventually lead, lead to these insights that make a really great creative for a brand. And I want to actually give an example. I'm not going to show y'all, but I want to just verbally tell you an example. So we had one client where they let us to do anything creatively. So um, we will make ads impromptu for them if we see the creative fatigue happening, which we do for a lot of our clients. Um, just some approve them a lot faster and easier than others. But for this client specifically, there was a trending audio that was really general. So we made an ad. It was a green screen speaking to a new part of the client's business that just launched. It was more personalization focused. That ad was four seconds long. It was a green screen. The trending audio was four seconds long, became one of the top performers in the account. We had that ad iterate, that ad then be iterated upon met so many times that the performance of it lasted two to three months and was a top performer for majority of that time period. So it goes to show you how one creative that I'm not gonna lie, I filmed it, took me 15 minutes maybe just because I had to get the lighting right, um, was able to then drive our client's performance forward for two to three months because of the basic um, elements behind it and how we were able to iterate and change the text overlay, change the um, copy around it, just change the display card to then drive performance. And then we learned an important learning for that client, trends work. Let's make a few more trends based on that audio, maybe showing different green screens and so forth. So we're coming up on the final five minutes here. We're not going to get a chance to answer everyone's questions, but we'll try our best to get to them after. Sorry, jump in, Jenny. Sorry, about everything you have to use commercial audio on TikTok. I saw that people were upping that. We only use commercial audios. No way around it, in our opinion. We don't want our clients to get in trouble. <laughs> And then the big thing, like the question that I wanted to end with here, and if there's anything that pops in the chat, we can, if we have time, we can deal with it. I want us to put our brand hats on. So we're thinking about like, okay, launch something live, make a ton of iterations, stitch some stuff together. And what brands might be thinking is like, are we going to end up with like a Frankenstein version of what's going on here at the end of the day? Right? So Grace, I might throw this one to you first, and then you can pass the baton to whoever you need to. 
But I'm curious, like, how do you keep a finger on the pulse just of like making sure it represents the brand in a way that they're happy with still without it being too, for lack of better words, Frankenstein-y? Yeah. And I think it all, this all has to do with the scripting element of finding ways to take the performing elements and combine them together. So like, for example, I'm thinking of, we had a concept that was a green screen, fully completely different concept format versus another one that was live and in person, but both performed extremely well. So we wanted to take certain elements from that live speaking in person and include it in our green screen. And then that way we were able to combine the two. It was a rating my XYZ concept. We were able to put it in a green screen, that format that we know works, but still include the messaging that we wanted to include and have it all come to fruition. It really is a tailored, very meticulous process, making sure that each and every element of the brand is involved, but it really is, it's in the scripting. It is all a part of the process. And then Isabel, in your world, because your team is going to be jumping in and just making some changes at that point, is there a finger on the pulse that you will maintain? Yeah, definitely. I also think like this speaks to all channels that work with a brand is that we need to make sure that the aesthetic is cohesive across the board, but that the creative is made with that channel that it's being pushed on in mind. Um, so the creatives that Grace deliver, for example, Grace, I'm just using you as an example. Um, she'll deliver these concepts all for this brand. There's, there's generally speaking, they all seamlessly connect because of the brand's identity. Of course, we're like tapping into things that work on TikTok and, and things that we're seeing through our ongoing analysis and through honestly being users on TikTok too. Um, but we it's holistically speaking with respect to the brand is that brand vision and that brand identity still needs to be apparent and visible through the creative. So I also think that's a really key part of making sure that the iterations work or look right and mashups and whatnot, um, since we are keeping that brand's identity and, and aesthetic in mind. And Isabel, I think we also got a question just about like, in terms of running the same creatives on Meta, I think Isabel and I work together on one of our clients where our winners that we have found through this iteration process are winners on Meta and YouTube Shorts and Pinterest. Mm -hmm because we have found the right sort of formula for that particular concept. So it works across the board. And that also speaks to, again, like the cohesion and having the same look across, uh, not the same look, but generally speaking, the same vibe or aesthetic <laughs> that you're capitalizing for that brand. It doesn't look like this should not be on Facebook and it should be on TikTok. It still blends into their efforts. So yeah, I agree. Perfect. Well, I think this is, I think this is the right place to end. Um, Jenny, Isabel, Grace, thank you so, so much for taking the time out of your days and, and going through this with everybody in the audience and the recording that will be sent out. Audience member, um, audience members, we love y'all, like part of the community. We know you all have amazing questions, love the answers that are coming in. Thank you so much for participating. Um, I will say again, the recording is going to go out after a quick survey is as well. Please, please, please fill that out because we know we want to figure out what to do next. Um, but thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your days and we will all chat soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.